my job is to try and sum up a conference which I've gone all the way from people like Keyshaw and Jeff Immelt um, and prevent you going off too quickly to drink at the end, which is surely the greater aim. Um, so I'm going to launch into as many sort of big picture thoughts as I can. And I suppose my case to you um, at the moment is one that I think the right way to look at the world is through a lens of what I would describe as paranoid optimism. Um, you may, by the end, think that my paranoia is so great that the optimism basically is almost entirely ill-founded, but that would be my starting point. And I think there is a big danger at the moment that when you look around the world, particularly for people in many of the positions of people here, that there is an immediate tendency that this is a much easier world to be a day trader, it's a much easier world to be a daily blogger, than it is necessarily to be um, somebody who's taking long-term investment decisions or thinking about strategy, or for that matter, trying to edit a weekly newspaper. And from all those points of view, I think the crucial thing is first to stand back. And I think from that perspective, there are really three questions. The first is, you know, where were we going? The second question is, what went wrong? And the last is, where are we going now? And it strikes me that at this precise moment, we are so heavily in the car crash stage of analysis. We're so angry with the driver, we're so cross with everything to do with it that we often don't step back and see. So going to the first of those questions about where the world was heading, I think I would stand as far back as I humanly could and argue that the direction it was going in the period, roughly speaking, from 1975 to 2006 was an immensely good one. That period, I think, will be described always as the great opening up, or to maybe something like the re-emergence of Asia. It will not be described in terms of the war on terror or other lesser historical moments within that. And what it will focus on when historians come back to look at that particular time is it will look, I think, perhaps at one fact beyond anything else. It will look at the idea that a billion people were somehow dragged out of something very close to extreme poverty into something much closer to a, to a middle class. And yes, that great opening up had many, many other effects, not least, in fact, in places like this. But overall, that was the big deal of what happened. That is the big thing which will stand out. Certainly, it will stand out far more than people like Fred Goodwin and Bernie Madoff, because when people come to look at this period, those are not going to be the big winners. It's going to be that portion of the world which leapt forward. And I think that was fundamentally good news. It was good news, I suppose, from the economist's point of view, as the ideals we, we triumphed. I think it was also good, to be somewhat more particular, for Britain as well. It strikes me repeatedly that the workforce, which um, was somewhat unfortunately alluded to, when I used to be a banker for those glorious two years of non-performance, back then the very idea that Britain would seem the country which strangely is the one which was most happy at the developing world, developed world, I think, with that great opening up. If you look at the numbers, we are the country which is still most happy with foreigners coming to buy our companies. We are most happy with free trade, much, much greater support for globalization than, say, in the United States. And we're also, despite what you may occasionally read in the Daily Mail, the country which is most happy with immigration. From the point of view of examining that huge era which happened, Britain on the whole did incredibly well. That does not mean that what has happened since has not been bad, and it doesn't mean that you could look at it all through kind of blithe, uh, rose-tinted spectacles for every happy, successful Czech waitress in Covent Garden, there are one or two disgruntled um, youths in Bradford with much worse things on their mind. But the fundamental point that Britain in particular and the sort of ideas from the London Business School when I first came here, those sort of things have pushed around this country. Britain is unimaginably better than it was back then. And yet, I think, to be very clear, that world, which seems so good and so, so straightforward, has very obviously gone wrong. And what's happened, and I think again, to simplify wildly, when I look at the crash, I look really at it in terms of four different stages. I think there's been a financial crisis, an economic crisis, a political crisis, and then finally an ideological crisis. And I'm going to focus a little bit more on the ones at the end, 
given the other people you've heard before, particularly people like Martin Wolf. I think the financial crisis was self-explanatory. It reached its peak at that time when Lehman went to the wall, or perhaps I think from my perspective it was even more vibrant that week when people took the TARP plan to Congress. And yes, I know that the, the, the TARP plan had flaws, and yes, I know that many people disliked it, but still fundamentally when you looked at the markets, the markets thought something dramatic was going to happen. They thought the most powerful engine in the world was going to come to the rescue, and it didn't. And I think that was the moment when the financial crisis seemed to peak and seemed to coalesce. And what is interesting since then is it spawned this much wider, very obvious economic crisis, no longer just Anglo-Saxon, no longer just financial. If you look at the numbers from Germany or Asia, you see really horrific numbers for things like machine tools from Germany. You see vast numbers down for notebooks from Taiwan. You see numbers for cars in a whole host of different places. And so it has spread into a much wider economic crisis. But what's interesting to me is the economic crisis now comes back and moves into the political, into the financial crisis, making it worse for all the bad debt, which is on banks' books, which is self-evidently not been cleared yet. But also fundamentally what happens is that the economic crisis and the financial crisis together have, I think, spawned a very fundamental political crisis. And I think it's worth bearing keeping your eyes on that political crisis, because that, strangely, could have as much impact on you, I think, in the future, as the other two. When I look at that political crisis, I think of the political crisis within countries and the political crisis between countries. When I look within countries, I think, very obviously, if you've watched what happened to Gordon Brown, it's self-evident the destruction that can follow, the political destruction that can follow economic problems. I think it's also worth actually stressing, if you go to America, and you talk to Congress people, we on this side of the Atlantic, I think particularly, tend to jump to the assumption, particularly nowadays, that Barack Obama was somehow inevitably elected. Congress people on both sides of the aisle do not think about it that way. They remember that weekend of the Lehman problems. Going into that weekend, McCain was either level pegging or in some private polls just ahead. The fact that he handled that so badly has stayed, I think, with plenty of, um, of congressmen since as a sign that this problem can unseat them, it can cause them difficulties. But for that matter, at Trinkishal's end of the world, if you go to China, I'm relentlessly impressed by the way in which the regime there is extremely vulnerable, extremely um, reflective of what is happening in the economy behind Lowit. One of the dirty secrets, which is very hard for Democrats like me to push, is that in a very weird way, totalitarian regimes are hypersensitive to what is happening at the very bottom, not least because the sort of overthrow which could haunt them is so much worse than just having to move with Sarah and the children back to Scotland. But what strikes me is the way in which China is coming to terms with so many other different forms of social change. To give one brief plug for a, a book I've just written about religion and politics, I think that China is well on its way to being the world's biggest Christian country already as many, perhaps as 100 million Christians in China. If you talk to the leadership about that, they have a very different impression. One half of them quite likes that as a glue to bind their country together. The other half is deeply frightened by the fact that more people go to church every Sunday now in China than are actually members of the Communist Party. The churches are arguably the world, the biggest NGO in China, that they worry that some repetition of something like the Falun Gong is underway. If you have all those insecurities eating away at you, the economy also factors in domestic politics. But I think in some ways it's the, it's the relations between countries which we should worry about most. And if I had to look at a particular one, I would look at China and America and the tensions between those two. I think it's very difficult to exaggerate to European audiences the way in which America feels threatened and it feels the dragon's breath on its shoulder in the way that we have not done for a hundred years. There's that thing about being number one and somebody is just behind you when it is a very different sensation to what we're used to. If you want another example, I would look at the tensions between Eastern Europe and Western Europe. If you look at that region between Berlin all the way to Vladivostok, it strikes me that a vast amount of that is insolvent or very close to it, and a big part of that bill is likely to end up in Western Europe and perhaps Germany in particular. It strikes me there's a very big balance between people who are roughly my age and above in Germany who seem to take it for granted that Germany will somehow step up and bail everyone out 
and those who are younger than me who tend to take the attitude that the Polish plumber who took your job does not necessarily deserve to get his mortgage paid off. I think if that is where we have got to, a financial crisis spawning an economic crisis and in turn spawning a bigger political crisis, I think that leads to the third question about where are we going to and to my paranoid optimism such as it is. I think any view about how well we're doing, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure Martin Wolf would have echoed some of these sentiments, is has to be coached in terms of timing and what you actually mean by, by a recovery. In terms of timing, I'm at least looking out to the middle of next year rather than now. I don't buy, buy the glimmers of hope which people, particularly at this moment, are pushing. I think it's worth noting that between 1929 and 1932, the stock market four times rose by more than 20%. And I think too many people at the moment are focusing on the idea of public sector, I see a huge amount of public sector money piling into the economy just about everywhere, even places like China. I do not see the private sector demand, which I want to see to ensure a much bigger lasting economy revi revival. So I don't see a recovery coming rapidly. I see a lot of problems to do with the balance sheets of banks being sorted out, not least actually in fact in continental Europe. If that is one holdback in terms of the way in which the, the, the world is coming back. My second point, which is again sound somewhat cliche, but I think cannot be exaggerated too often, is the idea that the whatever we are heading back to, the new normal will not be the old normal. Repeatedly, I think possibly more in America than Britain, you come across audiences and investors whose assumption about where we are going back to is somewhere very close to the world in 2006. All the evidence of economic history is when these things go through, you do not re-emerge into the same sunship world, world that we are previously in. If you want one example, look at the US savings rate. That went down as low as 0%, it's now up to around 5%. If it were to go, it's not up to 7%, or even perhaps beyond that. There was once a time, after all, when Americans were famous for being savers rather than consumers. You only have to imagine an American savings rate of 10% or higher, imagine what that does to the American consumer, to see that perhaps things would not be the same. I think the idea that we're heading back towards a world where finance takes such a large proportion of the economy is also something that we have to, have to push to one side. But when I think about this idea that the old normal is not the new normal, I think fundamentally, again, a lot of my thoughts end up in politics. And that, I think, brings me to the fourth stage of those crises I talked about, which is ideological. It strikes me that there is a straightforward ideological battle going on at the moment. And that ideological battle is rooted in the idea that somehow capitalism put in a big way the same things which is on the business school, and for that matter, the economist has stood for it for a long time have not worked. And it strikes me that that battle has to be struck into two different bits. The first is where you actually fight it, and the second is to journalistically look at it. Ideologically, I think most of the people who are attacking capitalism are coming from completely the wrong end. They're conflating two things. One is a crisis in finance with a broader crisis in, 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 in capitalism generally. Not even the most liberal, libertarian, free market sort could stand in front of you and say it was a perfectly fine and wonderful system of finance where we ended up with $62 trillion worth of credit default swaps and $10 trillion worth of off-balance sheet banking assets in America. It wasn't, it was a mess, and it needs to be changed, it needs to be regulated in different ways. But that is a very, very big step from going to that to the sort of laws you're seeing in America and very much just recently in Europe in terms of saying other things were to blame on a much broader capitalistic stake. That the whole world, which I described earlier, that huge jump forward is in difficulty. And so ideologically, I can tell you that the economists will fight that battle pretty much to the last man. We think that still the principles of liberal capitalism are the ones to battle for. And yet, fundamentally, as a journalist, I have to tell you very straightforwardly that we are losing that battle. It strikes me, if you look around the world, it is not that side of the argument which is gaining ground, it is the other one. And so when you think about that idea of the old normal not being the new normal, 
The two, I think, are linked in terms to do with the politics. I think fundamentally the world in which we live in is going to be different politically. Most obviously, I think you're seeing a rise of protectionism in various different sorts, not least in the sort of countries that attend um, G8 meetings like the one which is coming up, where they all pledge immediately that free trade is the one thing they won't touch, and then they rush home and tend to raise tariffs. But I think more generally, the world in which business is having to operate, and I think this is pretty much a global phenomenon, is one where there will be a bigger role for the state. Most obviously, there's a bigger role for the public sector already. That may be somewhat tempered by the need to pay off debt, but I think it's going to be increased by the amount of rules. I think, by the same token, the whole atmosphere in which we've lived for that 25 years, which I talked about, where deregulation was usually seen as a good thing, is changing. How many people here would be brave enough to wander out and say that the answer to education problems in a particular country was more deregulation. I think there's a huge degree of mission creep of politicians who've taken over and moved into particular industries or moved particularly into banking who said they would only stay within banking but which are now being pushed into other things. And again, it's very difficult. We criticize people like Barack Obama for bailing out Detroit and yet fundamentally it'd be an amazingly brave politician who went to go and see General Motors and tried to explain to their 240,000 workers why they should not get money, whilst Morgan Stanley gets 15 billion for somewhere around 10,000 people. Now for those reasons, I think politics is gonna sit, it's gonna cause great problems, and perhaps pertinently to many of the people in this room, I'm worried particularly by the ascent of a form of bash the rich mentality, which I think goes right the way through both sides of the Atlantic. You only have to look at either the brown budget over here, I don't think there's any point in referring to it as the darling budget, um, or else the um, Obama budget in America to see exactly what I'm thinking about. But I think that is going to be a culture against which capitalism is going to have to struggle, is have to go forward. So why, despite all those levels of paranoia, do I remain an optimist? Why, underneath it, do I still think the thing is going forward? It's partly to do with price. I think some things now really generally are cheap, but once you see that, there tends to be some active corporate activity to match that. It's partly to do with the fact that I think governments, even rather shambolic ones like the one we live under here, are still generally moving in the right direction. Stimulus was needed, stimulus is going in. I think the pattern of monetary easing is again having some effect. It may not be as well done as we all hoped, but it is just about working. But in the end, I think it comes back a lot to that billion people I spoke about at the beginning. It strikes me repeatedly that there is a large core of people, maybe perhaps not in the developed world, but certainly in the developing world, who have jumped, whose lives have jumped forward gigantically during that period in which I talked about, and who now have a vast say, a vast stake in that going forward. And that is partly a political judgment, but it's also an economic one. If you just want one set of statistics, no industry is more, I think, humbled by this thing in the West than the car industry. If you go and look at the car industry in the emerging world, well then I think you see a very different picture. If you take the sort of numbers where America has 900 cars for every 1,000 people, you then look at China, which has only got 30, or India, which has only got 10, you see the sort of economic growth, albeit with substantial environmental concerns coming with it, which I think does show some hope. Some of those miracle network numbers which people talk about, I think come back to that. I think in the end though, whatever verdict you have on the world at this moment, and I've skeltered through a lot of things very quickly, a lot depends on one man. And that, like everything else, I think is Barack Obama. It strikes me that if you take that vision, that possibility of a paranoid optimism of a world where it goes back to something not quite what we had before, but broadly in the same direction, but there is still the possibility of the same kind of amazing economic transformation that we saw before, then everything I think does really come down to Obama. It's very difficult to see another figure who could push the world in the right direction. I think it strikes me again, if you stand back, that when people come to judge Barack Obama, they will ask two questions about him. If you jump forward to say 2017, which is the date when you would hope to be leaving the White House. And the first will be, did he save capitalism? broadly defined? Did he somehow manage to make the world work in the same way as it did before? Did he still manage to keep 
that pressure to go forward, did he still manage to keep that fundamentally liberal idea, which has both enriched the world and, I think, spread political freedom as well? The second, much bigger question is, did he manage to bring in the emerging world? Because it strikes me, at least by 2017, or so, probably by 2017, and possibly, certainly by dates like 2025, the emerging world is going to count for an enormously larger share of the world in which we live in. If Obama does not bring those people into the new world order, and you have a classic example next week, where one of my great heroes, Silvio Berlusconi, is hosting, um, a no doubt, non-egocentric um, version of the G8. That, that, is, that is, yes, another organization at the moment which feels dysfunctional and wrong. There is, it strikes me, a, a club of sorts for, for Western democracies, but there is no way in which to run the world. Unless Obama has managed to bring countries like India, like Indonesia, and like Brazil into, and China, into the, into the overall picture, then I think he will have failed. And it's not just a question of institutions, I think it's a question of ideas. If Obama has not managed to persuade people that Western capitalism is something more than Lehman Brothers, and he has not managed to persuade people that Western justice is something more than Guantanamo Bay, then he will have failed. Do I think he will succeed? I think he stands as good a chance as any. I think the world of Obama is still one in which we can carry forward and have considerable trust in. I think the cliched example of the young boy in the Pakistani madrasa staring up at the screen and seeing a very different version of America on the television screen than what he was brought up with all those lies to believe is a cliche, but it is one which carries enormous weight. Whether Obama is capable of pushing the sort of economic reforms that he would need to, the sort of political reforms he would need to, to make that world come true and my paranoid optimism be justified, I don't know, but I will leave that to you. Thank you.